So we'll use a firewall as a means for controlling who can access a network. So now we're going to move into a practical aspect of security of we have a computer network, an IP-based network. We want to control who can access that network. Who can send data into the network and also in the opposite direction, who can send data out. So let's explain how firewalls work. So think of an organization, all right, a small one, your home with your own network or a large one like SIT or large companies. And in terms of their network access, they want to control the data going in and out of the network. Why? To stop people accessing services available on their network. For example, SIT has a database storing all the student information in terms including your grades, your financial information, uh, your contact information. We don't want anyone in the world to access that. A, we don't want them to read the information. B, we don't want them to modify the information. So how can we control access? There are different ways. Make sure it's password protected. Okay, make sure that to access the database you need a password. Make sure there's some permissions on the database so that even with a password you can only do certain things with it. And the next thing is to make sure that anyone on the internet has limited network access into the SIT network that stores the database. And that's what we're going to focus on now, the third approach of using a firewall to control, to control communications between different networks. So because all organizations need some internet connectivity, we can't avoid it. But the problem is that it makes uh, potential security holes uh, present in our computer system and we get threats that arise. That is, people may try and hack in or break into the SIT network. So how do we stop that? We use a firewall. A firewall is a device either dedicated hardware or just some software running on some other computer device, but some device that controls the data going into a network and going out of a network. In the picture here, we can just separate the networks into internal and external. So the internal network is the network that we want to protect. So we want to stop others in the external network from accessing resources in the internal network. So if the internal network is SIT network, where we have the database server for all the student information, all the salary information, and grades and so on, we'd like to stop external users from accessing that. And that's one thing we can use the firewall for. For this to work, we need to, we need to have our firewall device in a location where all of the data between the networks passes via. <coughs> so our internal LAN for SIT, for example, and our external internet access, there's data that goes between the two networks the firewall should be in a location where the, all the data between these networks passes the firewall. So the firewall will then be used to control what data may go through and what is blocked. With the intention that, for example, if someone on the internet tries to access the SIT database, the firewall should block that access. So they cannot access it and cannot read your grades and student information. Or, another goal, someone in SIT tries to access the Facebook web server, the firewall may be configured to block that access because we don't want students to be accessing Facebook during class, for example. So we can use the firewall to control what external users can access inside our network 
and what internal users can access out on the internet. So we're going to look at how we can use the firewall to do that. So there's an internal and external and the firewall is trying to protect the internal network. Let's have a look at some of the details. What we need this firewall to do. So between our internal and external networks, or the inside and the outside, we need to make sure that all of the traffic, that is all of the data between those, passes via the firewall. And this slide, I think, should say all traffic from inside to outside and from outside to inside, both directions. Okay, so in both directions, any packet sent should pass through the firewall. And if we can ensure that, then we can configure the firewall to control what is allowed in and what's not. I would like to have a firewall on the door for this room so that all students who are going to talk in here and annoy me are not allowed in. But that's too expensive for me to implement. So maybe we'll just give you a penalty in the quiz which may be easier for me to implement. We need to make sure that all the packets between the two networks go via the firewall. And we'll give an example of what happens if that's not the case shortly. And then the firewall will control what's authorised in and what's authorised to go out. So there'll be a policy that the organisation sets that says only, a, only let packets that are going to the internal web server in, no other packets. Or only let students access these websites, but no other websites. So that's the, the requirements or the policy of the organisation then the firewall must implement that policy by controlling what can come in and what, what is blocked, what cannot come in. And we'll look at how we do that. That's what this topic will look at. The firewall is a security mechanism. It controls access to the network. If the firewall doesn't work, then it limits the security of our network. So the firewall itself must must not be easy to be attacked. If someone can compromise the firewall, then that can allow them to compromise the internal computers on the network and defeat the firewall mechanisms. So when we build a firewall, we must make sure that uh, it's not easy for others to compromise that firewall. It cannot be penetrated easily. So how do we control the traffic? The second point, only authorised traffic is allowed by the firewall. Four different techniques. We control based upon service, de direction of the traffic, the users that are communicating and the behaviour of those communications. We'll see examples of uh, the service control in detail today and the others a little bit. Service control is controlling what services people can access inside a network. Think of servers. SIT inside our network, we have a database server, we have different email servers, different web servers. We want to control what others on the internet can access with respect to our internal servers they should be able to access the public web server but they shouldn't be able to access the finance server. Okay. Or we may want to allow some people to access a selection of the web servers. So control which services uh, can be accessed in, inside and also outside. And to do that we will need to look at how the internet protocol works and in particular that IP packets, IP datagrams, have addresses and TCP and UDP use port numbers. So we'll look at how we can use addresses and port numbers to control what goes in and out. We'll see some detailed examples of that today. The other form of control, direction control. 
you may want to do things depending upon the direction of traffic. That is, I want to set up the firewall such that people from outside can access nothing, no web servers internal to SIT, but people inside SIT can access all web servers out, web servers out on the internet. So depending upon the direction, outside to in, or inside to out, we may have different uh, requirements, so direction control. User control. I may want to set it up differently for different users. All students in SIT are blocked from accessing Facebook, for example. Or, or one particular user, Dr. Tanarak, is allowed to access any website he likes. All other faculty members can only access some selection of websites. So based upon the user, control what can come in and out of the network. All students cannot access fa Facebook, so we need to set up some mechanism to identify students and then block when they're trying to access Facebook. So different policies for different users. We'd like a firewall to support that. And behavior. Depending upon the content that's being sent out to the internet and in from the internet, we may control the, the traffic in a different way. An example is that you're sending an email out to someone from ins inside SIT out to the internet. That email, if it contains some spam, the email goes to the firewall and the firewall checks the contents of the email. And if it detects that there is, this is a spam email, you're trying to spam people, then it may block that email. Or a virus. It may try and stop it so it doesn't spread out to others. So this is filtering based upon the content of the messages. We can look at who or what services we're trying to access the direction of communications, which users are trying to communicate, and what they're trying to do, in particular looking at the content of the messages, and try and set up a set of rules that will control the traffic that can go in and out of our network. Let's go to an example. Uh, or do we no, let's keep going and then we'll get to an example and spend some time. Uh, so generally we're talking about firewalls, what they should do. Uh, a firewall should define a single choke point. What's a choke point? Anyone? What's a choke point? Well, think of it as a single point where everything goes via. Everything is directed into that single location. That is, for a network, our firewall, well, we need to ensure that everything goes via that firewall. Let's see an example. We have some networks. the SIT Wi-Fi network with some access points and people can access. Then we have the SIT wired LAN, the Ethernet LAN that connects the offices and labs. And maybe the, we have the rest of the world, the internet. So what we would like is to make sure that all of the data between at least the Wi-Fi network and the internet goes via our firewall. So let's draw our firewall here. Some device which ensures that or is set up such that 
all of the data being sent from someone on the SIT Wi-Fi out to the internet goes via that firewall. Similar, all of the data being sent from people in the labs and offices via the wired LAN, the Ethernet LAN, is sent via that firewall out to the internet. So that the firewall is in a, in a position to, lo to filter what goes out and what comes in. So in this example, external is the internet, internal is the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet LAN. So we need to make sure that the firewall, all of the data is concentrated at, at one location, the firewall. Because the, all of the data going in and out of SIT or the organization's network goes through the firewall, it makes sense for that firewall to have other capabilities, to do things that are not necessarily security related. Some maybe, some are not. So one is to monitor things that are happening. Because whenever you, on the Wi-Fi or wired network, access internet services, your data is going through the firewall. The firewall can now monitor things that are happening in the network, like uh, monitor how much data you're sending out to the internet or how much you're downloading. And if you, if you, if the firewall administrator finds that some students are downloading 10 gigabytes per day, then take some action. So monitoring what's happening. Maybe someone out on the internet is trying to perform an attack on SIT, a denial of service attack, and sending many packets in to SIT. Therefore, the firewall, as it monitors the packets coming in, can detect someone's trying to attack SIT, let's do something about it. So by monitoring what's happening, we may use that for uh, supporting the network security and operation. Other features which are, again, not security related that the firewall may do. Similar to what we just said, it may count the packets, count the downloads by different users inside the internal network, either to stop them from downloading in the future or if it's an organisation to charge particular departments. So if instead of Wi-Fi and Ethernet this is one department of the company and this is a different department, then the firewall is a good location to count how much each department downloads and then charge each department based upon the, the fraction of the internet costs that they must uh, pay for each year. So some form of accounting is another location or is another capability that a firewall may implement. Virtual private networks, VPNs. A VPN, although we haven't covered and we may get to the end of the semester, a virtual private network can allow someone out on the internet at their home to access internal network services. So someone who's working at home, a VPN or virtual private network allows them to effectively log in to the internal network and giving them services as if they are sitting inside the internal network. Okay, that's what a VPN may do. Someone at home can connect to the, the internal network and it's, it's as if they're sitting inside the internal network in terms of the services they can access. So they can access all the databases that are internal, which normally an external internet user cannot. So that's what a virtual private network can do. And it makes sense for uh, firewalls to provide such a service to allow someone to create a virtual private network between their home and, say, the organisation's network via the firewall. So firewalls are usually located in locations in the network such that they are not just a firewall but also other services are provided.
firewalls have some limitations. They can't protect against someone bypassing the firewall. So one of our users on the wired LAN in my office, for example, is my office computer. When I access the internet, all my data goes via the firewall because it's on the wired LAN. But in my office computer, I plug in my, or I connect to my mobile phone and use my internet access via my mobile phone to whoever from AIS to my telecom provider. So now I've connected to the internet for my internal computer, but my data is no longer passing through the firewall. The firewall cannot do anything about this. There's no way to now control the traffic that is going out to the internet via this other, uh, other connection. So this bypasses the firewall and presents a security risk for the organization because now we can't control what's being sent in and out. Okay, so there are mechanisms that can bypass the firewall. And of course the firewall can do nothing about it. There may be, the firewall may be set up such that sometimes uh, it still doesn't protect against all types of threats and attacks on, on the internal network. Uh, related to the, the one we just talked about, similar to me accessing via the mobile phone, if there's an insecure wireless LAN access point, then some external user, someone here on the internet who's considered an external user, may get access via the Wi-Fi network, via some access point here. Therefore, this external user, which should have been blocked from accessing the internal network, if we have some Wi-Fi access point that is insecure, the, internal, the ex external user may get access to the internal network. So the firewall can do nothing about that. We need other measures to stop that. Similar people bringing in devices cannot be prevented by the firewall. We need other uh, policies in an organization or other technical measures to stop that. So let's look at different types of firewalls and go through an example for one. Packet filtering firewalls will go through first. Essentially, they have some rules to say which packets are allowed to come through the firewall and which should be blocked. So we configure the firewall to implement a set of rules and as packets come in, the firewall checks. Is this one allowed or not? We can extend that with stateful packet inspection. We'll see that adds ability to record what happened in the past. That improves things. And then we'll look at two different types of firewalls called proxies, which create intermediate connections between external and internal users. Normally a firewall, maybe this is not normal for you, but normally in organizations, firewalls are implemented on routers. Who has a firewall? Who has used a firewall before on their own computer? Don't be shy. If you use Windows, I suspect you've used a firewall. Anyone? All right. Who has not used a firewall? Who has never installed a firewall on their computer? That's more like it. Well, some people. Okay. On home computers, uh, usually a firewall is recommended either on the computer itself or maybe if you've got a cable or ADSL internet access, the firewall feature may be provided on that uh, ADSL router or modem. Okay? But I think many of you may have already downloaded and installed a firewall, and sometimes it comes with other software. Maybe it's part of antivirus. Okay? So usually that's on the end computer. But in organizations, the firewall is normally done on a router. 
and that firewall is there to protect the entire internal network. So instead of installing a firewall on every computer inside SIT to control what goes into each computer, we have a firewall on a router that connects SIT to the outside which controls what can come in and what can go out. So normally, and we'll assume in our examples, a firewall is implement, implemented on a router. Why a router? Because when we connect an internal network to an external network on the internet, what device normally does that? A router. So it's typically a router that connects internal to external Therefore, a firewall is usually just an, an addition to an existing router. It may be its own dedicated device. And as we said before, it may do things other than what a firewall needs to do. So some non-security features may be implemented in practice. So let's look at what a packet filtering firewall is. We, have, we start with a security policy. So the policy is what the organisation requires. The policy may be that no student can access uh, any service out on the internet except for web servers. Or no student can access uh, the Facebook web server on the internet. So that we have some policy which is set by the organisation and then we implement that policy using a set of rules. So we have a set of rules that will try to implement the desired policy. The rules define which packets can go through the firewall. So we'll define a set of rules that say which packets from the internet can come through this firewall into the internal networks. And similar, which packets from the internal networks can come through the firewall to outside the internet, to the external network. So the rules will define the packets that can go through the firewall. So then some rules need to be configured and then as packets arrive at the firewall, it inspects each packet and compares it against the rules which are already configured and it, if any rules match, it takes some action. And the actions we'll consider are accept or drop. Accept a packet means it can go on to the destination. Drop means it cannot go on. We'll delete it and not send it. Some other names we'll use, accept, allow, forward, drop, reject, discard, block, so different names for the actions that may be taken. So the firewall is configured by a set of rules that state some conditions under which the packets should be accepted or dropped. If the packet matches those conditions, the action is taken. What are the conditions? Well, in a simple packet filtering firewall, the conditions come from the packet information. And because we're dealing with the internet, it comes from the IP packet header and other packet headers like TCP and UDP. Let's just remind you of uh, some aspects of the internet protocol, in particular the IP packet header. This is a diagram of an IP datagram. We have a header and the data. So everything we're sending in our network has this structure. The header is normally 20 bytes with some optional uh, fields that we'll ignore and then some data. The header has different fields and everyone's seen this before. I've taught you all this in ITS 323. The two main fields our firewall is concerned with is the source IP address and destination IP address. So the packet header contains who sent this packet, who's, who created and is the original source, and who is going to consume the packet, who's the final destination. 
That's the source and destination IP address. So who it came from and who it's going to. So the firewall can use this information and a set of rules to say, let's allow packets from this source drop packets to this destination, for example. So that's those two fields we'll use. One other commonly used field in the IP header is the protocol field. The protocol field indicates what type of data is inside this IP datagram. Really it indicates the transport layer being used. In IP there are many transport protocols or there are multiple transport protocols that can be used. The common ones are TCP, UDP, we'll also see ICMP, but there are others as well. And the value of the protocol field in the header indicates what transport protocol is being used, that is what's inside the data here. If this is a TCP data, then the protocol field will indicate TCP by giving a number for TCP, number 6. UDP is a different number. So again, if we want to filter only allow TCP and UDP packets in and out of our network, we can check by the protocol field. Or, everyone's experts with ping, only block all ping packets. Ping uses ICMP, which is a protocol number of one. So we can check at the firewall and block all packets which have a protocol number that indicates ICMP, to block ping. So a packet filtering fire firewall mainly uses source and destination IP and the protocol field of the IP header. And then, depending upon the transport protocol, uses the header fields of the transport protocol. Here's TCP, for example. So this is the header for TCP. There's data and the header. The two things which are most important in this case are the source port and destination port. The port numbers identify applications. What's the port number when you're accessing Facebook? What port number is the server using? What port number? The web server. Again, 80, port number 80 for a web server. So by default, all web servers use port 80. So therefore, if we want to block web access, we can look at the port numbers used in the TCP header. If the destination is port 80, then we can control. We know that this packet is going to a web server and we can control depending upon our policy, whether we allow it or not. Similar for source ports. So most common servers use well-known port numbers. Port 80 for web servers, port 22 for secure shell servers, and many others. So these port numbers are commonly used. Sometimes other features of TCP are used. We'll come back to them uh, when we need them. UDP much simpler header, but also has a source and destination port, so same concept. So the five main fields that we look at in a firewall are source IP address, destination IP, source port, destination port, and protocol. Port numbers, IP addresses, and the protocol field which indicates the transport protocol. So what the firewall is configured to do is create a set of rules that will implement a policy to block or allow particular applications or users using those five fields. Let's go straight to an example. Here's an example. Example network. We have six subnets in this simple internet. 1110 is this subnet and it has some hosts on it. Dot 11 and dot 12. 1.1.1.11 1 
and 12. There's a router that connects that subnet to another subnet. And these other subnets with, I assume many hosts, but I've just drawn one for, for some of these, or one or two. So this is our example network that we'll use to configure a firewall. And in this example, we're going to set a firewall on router RA. A router connects two subnets together. So our firewall is going to operate on RA, the purple router. And the internal network is this subnet 1110. And the external networks is the rest. Okay, so from the perspective of this uh, subnet, this is internal, everyone else is external. So when we, when we configure the firewall for this subnet, we want to control what can come in and what can go out. So, let's say we want to set up our internal network so that no one, out, no one outside of our network can access the secure shell server on computer 11, this green one here. So we need to configure the firewall so that no one outside, the ones that we see plus any, anyone else who may arrive outside of our internal network, can access the secure shell server on computer with IP address 1.1.1.11. Create your firewall. There's your first task. Let's see some solutions. And we'll find someone to come up and write down the solution on the board. And we'll use a random number generator to choose someone to do it. But my random number generator is not so good sometimes. Sometimes it just chooses the people who are asleep or don't, who don't have an answer. Try and think of what rules you could create on the firewall so that no one outside can access computer 11, in particular the secure shell server on computer 11. And the rules will check those five characteristics of the packets. The five, the five features are source IP address, where did the packet come from, destination IP, who is it going to, protocol number, what transport protocol was being used, and I'll give you a hint, Secure Shell uses TCP, source port and destination port. Using those five values, create some conditions that would detect the packet that's going to the secure shell server on computer 11. So the firewall is set with some rule that says if the packet matches these conditions, we'll block or allow that packet. What are the conditions? Design them. You're a candidate for giving the demonstration. Anyone can design these conditions? Okay, here's another th candidate here. Okay, you just volunteered. Okay, two candidates for a presentation, for a demonstration. Try and think of, and the answer's uh, not in your lecture notes. This is a different one that I haven't given you, so you have to think a little bit. Here's a network. We want to stop others from accessing computer 11, in particular secure shell server on computer 11. What are the conditions of the packets? What of those five features of source IP, destination IP, protocol number, source port, destination port, what values should they take to match packets such that it will reply to those going to the secure shell server on computer 11. Anyone? Anyone have an idea of the conditions? Something, something. Okay, that's a good start. Okay, something, something TCP. What do you... 
Why did you say TCP? Secure Shell is an application layer protocol. Okay, you've used it. You've used it to log into other computers. SSH. It's an application layer protocol to connect you to other computers. It uses the transport layer protocol called TCP. Okay. There's no TCP flag that says it's SSH. Something else tells us that it's SSH. What? What tells us, and again, to keep it simple, uh, you've got it on your lecture notes. Given these five values, there are two addresses. Source IP address, destination IP address, source port number, destination port number, and protocol number, five different values. Create a set of conditions that would match packets going to that secure shell server. So we've mentioned TCP, protocol number should m indicate that we're dealing with TCP. What else? Destination. The destination IP address in the packet should be that of the server here, 1.1.1.11. So the title here is the policy. That's our requirement. Your organization's requirement is to stop anyone outside from accessing the secure shell server on computer 1.1.1.11. To implement that, we need to have some rule on the firewall that will block those packets so that we cannot access the QSL server. So, so far we've got the, the transport protocol should be TCP. The destination address should be 1.1.1.11. Okay, so that would match anything going to 1.1.1.11. What else? What about secure shell? Secure Shell is an application, yes. It has a port number, yes. Anyone want to know? guess? Someone knows the port number for Secure Shell? 22. Web servers use port 80. Secure Shell servers use port 22. Email servers, port 25. Uh, secure web browsing, port 443. So many different servers have their own port number assigned. So, if someone sends a packet, some of these red ones outside, sends a packet to this server, and if they're trying to access the secure shell server here, then that packet, the destination IP address, will be that of, the, of the, this computer, 1.1.1.11. That's the destination IP. The destination port number will be 22. Because to contact a server, the port number of that server is used as the destination. If you're contacting a web server, the destination port will be 80. Contacting a secure shell server, it's port 22. Destination IP 1.1.1.11, destination port 22. Transport protocol TCP. If the packet arrives at the firewall and matches those conditions, we should drop the packet or block it. And we can write those conditions. Ignore forward for the moment, the word forward there. The firewall should be configured so that the destination IP 1.1.1.11 Transport protocol is TCP. Why TCP? Because Secure Shell only uses TCP. And destination port 22, why? Because a Secure Shell server uses port 22. 
if a packet arrives at the firewall, then it has this destination, this protocol, and this destination port, then the action the firewall should take is to drop that packet. Do not send it on. Just delete it. Do not send it at all. So this is a rule. And this needs to be configured in the firewall to implement our policy. So come back to the concepts and we'll return to the example in a moment. A packet filtering firewall has a set of rules. The rules define which packets can go through the firewall. Packets which are accepted to go through or dropped, they cannot go through. So once we have a set of rules, we, when a packet arrives, the firewall compares the packet against the rules. If the rules match, take the action for those rules where the actions are either accept or drop. So what, what are the conditions for these rules? Well, so far we've seen that we've got five different conditions, five things to check for. The two IP addresses, source and destination. The two port numbers, source or destination. And the protocol number, the transport protocol being used. So they're the five common conditions. We'll see some others later that we can use, but let's start with these five. So the rules use these conditions, that is, I, source IP equals this value, destination port equals this value. That's the condition. So the rules are conditions defined using this packet information. And the action is usually accept or drop. And that makes up a rule. And in the example, we just saw one rule for our firewall. So the, the desired behavior, block secure shell access, the rule to implement that is shown here. Destination IP, protocol number, destination port, the action, drop. So three conditions, drop is the action to take. Questions? Your tasks in quizzes and in uh, homeworks will be to create some rules to, to implement some policy. So, keeping it simple, look at the IP addresses, the port numbers, and the protocol number, or the product transport protocol. Now, for this one, you needed to know that Secure Shell Server used port 22. Okay, so now you know. So now you know web browsing port 80, secure shell 22. There are others that you may need to learn over time. Now, what happens? Computer 47 tries to access the secure shell server on computer 11. So computer 47 wants to log in to the secure shell server here. So it creates a packet. What's the packet look like? Let's draw it. So, if we can try and draw our packet, and our packet if we look at our headers, it's going to be an IP datagram having a header values and inside that because it's secure shell it would be a TCP datagram containing the TCP header fields. Sorry, this is IP, this is TCP. But I'm going to draw the packet I'll get like this. I'm going to draw the packet so there's some data, there's an IP header, but I'll also draw a TCP header and just list the fields which are relevant for us instead of listing them all. The example is computer 47 wants to access the secure shell server on computer 11. So it creates a packet. Let's draw the packet it creates.
it's going to have an IP header and a TCP header and from our perspective the rest is the secure shell message so the secure shell data whatever that is data we're not going to look at the data we're going to look just at the headers and just at those five fields so we have a source IP address a destination IP address in the IP header and a protocol number. There are other fields but these are the ones that are of interest to us. What are the values? Source IP is the IP of the computer that creates it. Computer 4.4.4.47 and it's trying to contact 1.1.1.11 so that's the source and destination forty seven and your destination is 1.1.1.11 1 .1 so this is the the packet created by the sending node 44447 the protocol number identifies the transport protocol which is TCP you don't need to remember at this stage but that's actually a number six in the same way that port numbers map to particular servers protocol numbers map to particular transport protocols so those are three values in the IP header in addition the TCP header has the source port and the destination port this is the packet coming from the secure shell client on 44447 going to the secure shell server on 1.1.1.11 1 .1 so the desti destination port is the port of the server for secure shell which we've already said is port number 22 meaning secure shell what's the source port? Sorry? Not 22. The source port is usually dynamically assigned by the operating system. So we don't know. Let's just give it a random value. Okay? It's usually within some range, but uh, it's not fixed. It's not predictable. I've just made up a random value which is typical in the typical range. So we would not know that in advance. This is the packet created by the source computer. This external computer that wants to access our internal secure shell server. Three fields for the IP header, two fields for the TCP header. There are other fields, there's data, but those are the five values that we care about with respect to our firewall. The packet is sent through the internet. We don't care about how it gets there, but the routing means that this one creates it. It sends it to the router E, which would send it to router C. Eventually, that packet gets to router A. Okay, because the destination is this computer, so it gets to the router on that subnet. And that router, when it receives the packet, is running a firewall. So when the router receives the packet, it passes it to the firewall software, and the firewall software checks that packet against these conditions. 
Okay, so these this, these conditions are a rule configured in the firewall already. Compare these with the packet. This packet's received source IP, destination IP 11111, protocol TCP, destination port 22, and now compare it to the rule. Yep. Yes, the source uses a different port. With client server applications, usually servers have a well known, a fixed port number. Whereas clients usually get some random port number assigned by the operating system. Why? Because it's the client that initiates communications to the server. So the client must know the server's port number to contact it. So we use some fixed port number. So if I'm using Secure Shell, I know it will be 22. But to get a response back, the server learns the source port when it receives the request. Okay, so the server doesn't need to know this value in advance because it learns it when it receives the first packet. So source ports are normally some uh, dynamically assigned value. I just made up a random value here. The next pack or the next time they connect it may be a different source port. Okay. Yep. What if we use a VPN? We're not, okay? We may see that we, when we talk about ways to bypass firewalls, there are ways to bypass and a VPN may assist in that, that case, but not yet. This is the packet sent. It arrives at the firewall. Compare the packet details with the firewall rule. Compare that with this rule here, these conditions. Forget about forward for the moment. The rule is if the packet has this destination of 11111 and if the protocol is TCP and if the destination port is 22 then drop this packet. And as if you compare, these three conditions match. For that packet, it matches. And therefore, the packet that arrives at the, came from 47 through EEC, arrived at the firewall, router A, the firewall compares the packet with the rule, it matches. Therefore, the action taken for that packet is to drop it. Drop it means delete it. Do not send. Therefore, the packet will not arrive at computer 11. And therefore, there will be no response. So we've blocked access to the secure shell server on computer 11. Any questions? Everyone can create the next rule for the next task. We didn't get any demos. That was disappointing. We've still got some candidates, so any questions about this or about your assignment for your other course? I'll answer anything, just as long as it's a question. Okay, note that the rules, the source IP, we don't care the value. I didn't list the source IP here. I didn't list the source port in the rule meaning it doesn't matter what value that is, as long as these three match, destination IP, protocol, destination port, as long as they match, then that packet matches. The values I didn't list can be any value. And they are, they are 44447 was the source IP. If computer 36 sent the packet, it would have the same destination IP and port and the same protocol and therefore would be blocked doesn't matter which of these red computers sent that packet, if they're all going to the secure shell server on computer 11, these three values would all match and that packet would be dropped. So now design the next rule.
computer 12 is that for some, some user inside the network. So this is an internal computer. We want to stop them from accessing web servers on this network. Try and design the rule, the set of conditions for the firewall to achieve that policy. Try and write down what are the conditions here in terms of source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and protocol so that computer 12 cannot access any web servers on network 3330. And we have a volunteer. Welcome, come to the front. You can show people how to design this firewall. Come on. I'll let you write on the board in case you make a mistake and you can remove it. And I'll get you started. So we're dealing with five, five fields, five conditions that we can deal with. So what we need to do is write the conditions for these five values. Some may have values, some we don't care about, such that this firewall, router A, will block access to the web servers on this network 3. So come up and write the values that the source IP, destination IP, source and destination port, and the protocol number should be in this rule. And they, some of your friends can help you, or if they're not real friends, they'll laugh at you. So think about who's sending and who the destinations are. Source IP. Let's do it. Let's do it easily. Let's just go through from top to bottom. What's the source IP? So block access to the web servers on this network from computer 12, which has IP 1.1.1.12. So from computer 12, therefore the source IP must be that of computer 12. Destination IP. She's on the right track. I think she knows what she's doing. It's all right. This one's a bit of a trick, or it's a bit different from before. And the hint is that we don't have to use the address of a particular host. We can use this network address. Okay, good. That is, the destination doesn't have to be the address of a computer, it can be the address of a network. And the network address is 3.3.3.0. That means everyone on that network. So the destination IP is 3.3.3.0. Source port. What value should it be? Anyone want to help? What value should the source port be? Dynamically, dynamically 
generated, meaning what value are you going to put in the firewall? You're setting up the firewall. 4712. All right, you set up 4712, but then it uses a different source port. It won't match. Okay, random number. A random number. Again, it won't match. So you don't use that? Don't use it. Don't, don't set a value. Any value. What character do you use for any value? Star. A wild card, for example, star. Star. Oh, that's not. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just that means any value. I think in programming and in different uh, computer systems, a star means has the meaning of a wild card. Means we don't care about the source port. Doesn't matter what value it is. It will, they will all match. So conceptually we think of a wild card or star. Okay. Destination port. No. What's the destination port? 80 because of web servers. So destination port 80. And the last one, protocol. Which transport protocol? The name of the transport protocol. It's still TCP. We know web browsing uses TCP. HTTP uses TCP. Six, that's great. Or you can just answer TCP. Because you remembered six means it's just the number for TCP. Okay, it has a number. Good. So, very easy. Create the rules. So far, just using these five conditions. And if we don't care of the value, right, here's just one way to write it down. Star means a wild card, any value. A packet is sent by computer 12 to computer 36 web server. The source will be computer 12's. The destination will be 33336, which matches this destination IP. Really, we should give the net mask because this is a network address. Again, think of it as a wildcard. It means any value in the range 3.3.3.3.3.3.1.2.36.35. Source port, if my application chooses port number 47215, well, the firewall rule matches that because the firewall rule says any value of source port. I don't care. Send it. Sending it to the web server, the web server, port 80, destination port 80. And web browsing uses the TCP as the protocol. Our packet will get to the firewall. The firewall will compare the packet details with this rule. It will match. And therefore, the action, so this is the conditions, the action should be dropped. Don't send it out, and therefore we can't contact the web server. So our rule in this case is the conditions which were listed on the board. So, so far we're keeping it very simple and just dealing with these five uh, fields. And depending upon our, our policy, so far we've created two rules. But then we may want to do something else and make more rules. So we build up a set of rules, put them in a table for the firewall. So when we configure the firewall, think of it as a, a table of rules. Here I've summarized them. Our first rule was from any source, if the destination has IP 1.1.1.11 and the port number is 22. So this notation is IP port number. If the protocol is TCP, then the action to take is to drop that packet. Our second rule we just created, if the source is computer 12, any port number, source port, any value, destination is this network, port 80, protocol TCP, action drop. 
And the third rule is what we call our default action or default policy. It says if there's a packet at the firewall that does not match rule one and it does not match rule two, then it will match this last one, which means any value of source, any destination, any protocol, except. Okay, so this is just to say for all other packets, let's accept them. Block these packets, drop these packets, accept everything else. So you can think of the rules being applied in order on the packets. And when we set up a firewall, we must create a table like this, or conceptually like that. Different software uses different notation. So I, wa I want you to be able to, given some policy, design some rules. So far we'll keep it simple and just use these five values. But it can be more complex. We can start to use the interface that the packet arrived on. Whether it's a TCP SYN or a TCP ACK, the MAC address, and then eventually start to use the contents if it's a HTTP request versus a HTTP response and tailor our rules to meet some very specific policies. But for us, I think so far, these five are the main ones. Any questions to finish today? This is a new topic that is more practical than some of the theory we've covered so far, but uh, quite important because you use it on a regular basis and will give you a chance to do some hands-on things. We will finish with some of the other types of firewalls and the differences on Thursday and then you'll get a chance to play around with firewalls, design some firewalls, Des design some rules. So let's stop there and continue on Thursday. <laughs>